three reasons why Americans are still broke. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Brian, you know, this show, uh, it sounds like it's going to be negative, but this is actually going to be a positive, uplifting show. But the truth of the matter is, is that we know in our current state of our country, there are a lot of folks that just don't make wise financial decisions and do not find themselves in the healthiest financial circumstance. And in our opinion, it's a little bit their fault most often. Yeah, I mean, we have a huge problem where I think the average American is trying to keep up with the Joneses. That's right. We have an issue where we're looking around. Instead of being happy with what we have, we're trying to look at our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And what we, what the, the all the statistics show is our neighbors are broke. <laughs> and, and here's what makes me so sad about this whole thing. You have everything in the world going for you. We, we are in a globalized economy, mm -hmm. meaning that the world is getting smaller and smaller. Innovation is actually speeding up. There is no reason that we all shouldn't be benefiting from these great things economically, yep. but we can't get out from underneath our own just consumption. That's right. It is consumerism that is destroying the ability to create an army of dollar bills. And what I think is so great is that uh, these three reasons are things that you can control. They're things that you can change, things you can improve upon. So we want to kind of educate you on why we feel a lot of Americans are broke. But it wouldn't be a money guy show unless we gave you some stats sure. to show you how bad Americans really are with money. The first thing <laughs> is... 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That, that means that 78% of Americans can't get to the next month if their paycheck doesn't come in this month. And it just doesn't have, doesn't have to be that way. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, that immediately tells me something right off the bat. You're probably not saving any of your current paycheck. Because if you were saving, you'd be building a little bit up. So you're spending everything that you make. And if you needed more proof of that... 60% of Americans can't even come up with $1,000. If they had an emergency, they're in trouble. That's exactly right. So let's figure out how to, let's talk about what do we actually do and what's the biggest reason why Americans will stay broke? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, that I'm, I'm reminded, I, I think it was my mom who says, maybe it was a school teacher. Um, she always used to say that uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. <laughs> And we think that that is the number one biggest reason why Americans stay broke is because they don't have any plan in place. They don't have any sort of budget, any sort of strategy in place from Jump Street. The biggest thing that we see, and I call it the rudderless ship or starting out on a roadmap. It, you know, it used to be, I don't even know if, if young people even know what a roadmap looks like anymore. I'm we sorry, get, a road, a road yeah, I know. Believe me, there used to be even whole cottage industries where like AAA, you tell them where you're going or you had, you know, and they'd print you out a little spiral booklet or you had MapQuest. You but like it, Waze is what you're talking it, about. Waze is exactly what I'm talking about. But imagine if you were going to a place you'd never visited and you didn't even use an app like Waze. You just basically said, I'm just going to fill my way through this. And I'll be honest with you, the average American, that is what they do in their 20s. That's what they do in their 30s. And it's a, probably about my age. That's when you get the midlife crisis that people go, whoa, wait a minute. I'm going to be at that destination, uh -huh. and I don't really know where to get there. I don't know how far it is. I don't know how much I need. That's right. And that's exactly what's going on. So we're skipping steps. So we want to kind of show you, because why would anybody buy premium brands, mm -hmm. buy designer clothes, buy designer or luxury cars without knowing exactly where they stand and if they're ahead of the curve, behind the curve, or gotten run over by the curve. But that is what is going on with America. And, and don't mishear us. There's nothing wrong with luxury brands or nice homes or nice cars or fill in the blank. But there is an order in which you're supposed to achieve those types of things. And if you don't have the financial foundations, if you don't have the solid footing in place and you get it out of whack, you set yourself up to be rudderless and to stay rudderless as you work through your financial journey. So let's talk about planning because that is the thing. Fidelity has a study they've come out with. I've put it in so many shows that I put it out there is that one of the biggest indicators of success is that have you taken the time to actually create a plan? So let's go through Money Guy tips sure. so we can make sure you're not a rudderless ship, that there's actually something going on there. So the first thing you can do when you're starting out and trying to figure things out is Knowing actually where are you leaking water, where are you spending your money, and the best thing you can do for that is a budget. Yeah, so you know we hear us all the time. Now I'm going to ask you, uh, true or false, Brian? Do you budget? 
No, I hate budgeting. False. I, I, I'm the same way. We don't budget. However, there was a time in the life of Bo Hansen where I did have a budget. When yep. I first started out, I had to understand if this is how much I have coming in, this is how much I need to have going out. How do I make those two line up? And so we think that early on, it may make sense for you to have a budget. And what's great is in the world in which we live, there are apps, there are worksheets, there are spreadsheets, there are all kinds of things that you can now use at your disposal to make this easier than it's ever been before. Yeah, budgeting is no different than exercise to me. I mean, it's something that I know I don't like to do, but it is something I've practiced in the past because I was trying to develop muscle memory, create habits. And that's the part is that if you don't do this, you really are not going to get the fruits of what comes that's from right. laying the groundwork of budgeting. So make sure you understand that. The next step is automate. You've got to automate the process. The more things that you can set up, and this is what is going to allow you, if you hate budgeting, there is a way to get away from budgeting. It's actually you pay yourself first. You automate all the things that are coming out of your, your accounts mm -hmm. monthly. So you're funding all the big things first, and then you don't have to worry about the minutia. Focus on the little stuff, but you can't get there unless you put in the work on the front end first. Yeah, you know, the dirty little secret about human nature is if we operate under this place where, you know what, I'm just going to wait till the end of the month, and whatever I have left over, I'm going to save. Well, it's amazing how every single time you set yourself up to do that, you get to the end of the month, and somehow that money has found a way to evaporate. So if you can make yourself, just like you said, pay yourself first, have an environment of forced scarcity, you will set yourself up for success long term. So we've got the automated. When I mentioned the concept of forced scarcity, what that's talking about is everybody knows we are big big proponents of you should be saving 20 to 25 percent for the future. A lot of people who are, are younger are like, how do I get to, or even people in their 30s go, how do I get to 20, 25 percent? Force scarcity is one of the biggest tools you can do because all it means is, is that every time you have a step up in your income stream or your cash flow, that instead of letting that create lifestyle creep or you let that get away from you, you actually allocate deliberately mm -hmm. a portion of that towards long-term savings, yep. whether it's you know saving for Roth, whether it's 401k or retirement, there's ways that that has a purpose. You are a field general of your army of dollar bills is making sure everything has a purpose. That's exactly right. Um, all this also leads to a, a greater plan and, and how everything can kind of work together. Because we mentioned this, if you look at the financial order of operations, or as the money guy affectionately likes to call foo, you know, it is one of those things where you talk, we need to talk about order of operations is cash reserves, mm -hmm. making sure you have your risk and your estate That's basics right. covered. So if you if something happens to you, people who are counting on you are not hurt, yep. making sure you have a healthy dose of of concern about debt and a good relationship with it. And then you always want to make sure you're thinking about the future with the retirement savings too. Yeah. The, one of the things you have to recognize is that if you get one piece, okay, I've got the budget. Oh, okay. I've, I've got my automated savings. There are different areas where you have to fold in. If you have it, you ought to go check out. We've done a bunch of shows on the Money Guy Financial Order of Operations. Go check those out. And that's how you can make sure you're actually on the path, you're not that rudderless ship knowing that you're moving in the direction you're supposed to be moving. So to close out, step one, make sure you have a plan of action yep. and actually stick to it. And it's okay if it gets amended every year or you have to adjust it in the beginning. Just make sure you're doing something because a dream does not become a reality until it's actually put to pl put in action and put on paper. So go ahead, quit being a dreamer, actually being a person that's actually starting to build something for the future. Love it. Number two. You have to have a healthy relationship with debt. But the truth is, the majority actually have a very unhealthy relationship with debt. You know, I don't know if I'd say this is the biggest reason, but I, but I think in America specifically, this, this might actually be the biggest reason from a yeah. consumer standpoint of why people find themselves in trouble. It's because it's just become too easy to borrow our lives, to yeah. fake what we have going on, and to not actually own anything. Well, I, I think, you know, and it, it's just the way things are. Life is kind of cruel. Mm -hmm. While you're young, while you have carefree, no, no, you don't have children, you don't have anything that's tying you down, you're typically broke. Mm -hmm. So some enterprising group has realized, you know what, we got all these people that are young, they have energy, and they have a lot of free time on themselves, but they don't have any money. If we could only create a product that would help them feel like they did they have money have when money. they really don't have money. That was the beginning of the credit card. That's right. Because that's exactly what has happened is, is that you have an entire group of people 
who are faking their life. They're going on trips. They're doing all kind of things, buying consumerism on steroids. Mm -hmm. But then, guys, I'm telling you, this is a trap. That's right. You are slowly working yourself into a situation where the debt slowly consumes you to the point that eventually you become a slave right. to the payments that you're having to do. So don't let... It really is. Debt is like a, a knife. Mm -hmm. It's a very scary, sharp instrument. It can be very productive. It can help you cut up your fruit, cut up your vegetables. It's awesome in those aspects. But if you don't ever respect, if you forget what a knife is and how sharp it is, it can turn into a chainsaw or it can turn into something that breaks you. It can, it can actually lose an appendage. Uh, so when it comes to debt, we think that there are really four areas, four big areas where they can just lead you down the dark and scary path. And Brian, you already alluded to the very first one, credit cards. Yeah, That's the one I think as consumers that gets us in the most amount of trouble the quickest because it's just so easy to let it get out of whack. So let's kind of go through some stats on credit cards. Why are these things so negative? The first thing is interest rates are rough. We just talked to a group of 20-something engineers, so yep. they're highly educated. We asked them what credit card rates were for the for credit them, cards they yeah. had. And they were like 22%, 23%. And I was like, that makes sense because we're always quoting the average credit card rate. Mm -hmm. But for younger people, this thing is even more disastrous than even what the average is. That's right. You can see that the average APR for credit cards right now is 17.3%. Obviously, a big portion of that's driven up by young folks who are in the 20s. Yeah, and, and I'm sad that the number is... Typical credit card debt is around eighty four hundred dollars. That's right. That that's a lot of that's a lot of money, especially accruing at seventeen point three percent. So, what's the big thing that you can do to kind of protect yourself? Make sure if you are someone who does utilize credit cards, you pay them off in full every month. If you find that you're the kind of person that doesn't have the discipline, doesn't have the ability to do that, then just don't use them. Go cold turkey, cut them up, get rid of them. But if you are someone who likes the points, likes the cash back, likes the rewards, make sure you're paying them off every month in full. So I feel like me and this slide are kind of like hanging out socially now because we gave <laughs> multiple presentations last week with this slide. We're doing it today. I, and then, but then it hit me. I was like, Brian, this is okay. This is a public service announcement. You need the public to understand debt really is a cuss word. Mm -hmm. If you can't pay your credit card debt off monthly, don't even use it. Go right. cold turkey. You know, do all the things. You might have to be a Dave Ramsey type person yep. where you just swear these things off because they are dangerous, dangerous, dangerous if you're not responsible. Remember, our advice is not for the 80% of the public that has behavioral issues and no discipline. We're only giving advice to the 20% that are can go beyond common That's sense right. and realize debt is... No, millionaires don't even struggle with debt. So why should I have a problem with this? So if you struggle with debt, get that problem fixed so you can graduate to more of what we're kind of sharing right. with, with the audience on this. Now, for most folks, credit cards are kind of the smaller thing, right? Like you you rack up credit card debt, 100 bucks, 200 bucks at a time. Well, you heard that the average debt was like 8,400. Right. Yep. 8,400. Okay, that that's that's sad, but I know where you're, where you're going. Let's talk about something that actually can that really can actually blow hurt. things up. That's right. Uh, so we think sort of the next second big mistake that you can make is purchasing more automobile than you can realistically afford. And cars. Cars, and, and I've said this multiple times, I think this is my new favorite thing to talk about because once again, we spent a lot of time with the young investors last mm -hmm. week giving them advice. I really do believe auto loans are napalm for your financial life yep. because they are the biggest thing. And I think it, it, it's so cruel that this is an emotional, psychological thing that happens because what is probably the cool, quickest way to make yourself cool in high school? Oh, you have to drive a nice car. If you have if a nice, you have car, a nice car, you really can move up. The, at least it worked, worked that way back in the old days. You know, that, that I was in high school, the cooler your car way was, the, 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 the way things went up on the social scale. Now, fortunately, college, I didn't feel that pressure. Sure. Maybe it is that way, but college didn't feel that way. But I think there's always an insecure teenager inside every one of us that thinks, you know what? The car is going to be where I make my mark and show people how successful I am. Yep. Why else would people go through these efforts? So that's why it's not uncommon where you see people graduate college or just graduate and get their first big job. They think they need to reward themselves mm -hmm. with a car. 
That sounds awesome on paper. And there's a, a, I mean, you can't even turn on the big, th- was it the third biggest advertisers are, is the auto, the auto industry. industry yeah. Because it's like beer, pharmaceuticals, um, pharmaceuticals and then and like auto. car, yeah. you know, auto industry. So there's a lot of people telling you, go reward yourself. Mm-hmm. There's even holiday Christmas commercials. I saw those comments. I think it's General Motors that has like an SUV. But he thought he was buying the SUV for his wife and he got this big black truck for himself. And then the wife runs out and is like, oh. I'm so excited, but I'm keeping the truck, and it's supposed to be all fun. They ought to be beating each other's rear ends because they bought two brand new vehicles without talking to the spouse about what's going on. But this is what is being whispered into your ear at all times. Yeah, and this isn't just anecdotal. We know, this is actually statistically proven, that one in three people who trade in a car for a new one are actually underwater on the car they're trading in. So not only are they taking on debt, they're actually taking on negative equity when they go to buy a new car. So let's talk about how we can avoid this. We've said this before. I feel like we're camp- hanging out with this one too because we used this last week for our presentation. We talk about the money guy concept of 23-8. And all that, is, all that means is you're going to be, we are reasonable with you guys. We realize cars are horrible. These things depreciate like a rock. It's yep. not uncommon for you to lose 40 to 50% of your value just in the first few years you own it. But I'm going to be, I'm going to treat you like you're an adult. And I realize that sometimes you might actually have to finance that minivan for your family. Sure. So with that understanding, it's okay if you put 20% down, but you will slap pay that car off within three years. Mm-hmm. That is just, it's going to happen within three years, and you're not going to let the car payments exceed 8% of your gross income. Exactly. But, Bo, there is one exception, one big asterisk that we put on there. What is that for luxury cars? If you want to buy a luxury car, so this is Tesla, BMW, Mercedes, Lexus, Acura, fill in the blank, you need to be able to pay it off in one year. Yeah. 12 months, same as cash. So I imagine there's two questions. Well, hey, guys, but what if I can't pay off my luxury car in one year? Then you are buying too nice of a car. Too nice. Or uh, you're just you're, you're faking your lifestyle. Everything we're telling you about faking it until you're making it, you resemble that if you can't pay the car off or if you want. I, I, I've shared this story. I had somebody reach out that said, hey, can you do a friend of a family member and talk to this person because they're really panicked about the car situation. Mm-hmm. The car's breaking down. They get, need to get a new car. They're thinking about taking money from their 401k. I said, sure, I'll talk to them. So I traded some emails. And then I did, it all went radio silent on me. And I, and I, I reached out and I said, what, what happened? What was it? Oh, they actually got a great deal on some financing on a brand new BMW. Oh, and I was like, that's oh, financial trouble. That's this, what you need. Is, this is how people keep going deeper and deeper that's right. into the ditch of bad financial decisions. So just always be aware of these things. So a car, so credit cards were bad, and a car is even worse because now we're talking about big numbers. Let's talk now, Brian, about the biggie, the big one. Well, I mean, at least with the car, people get to see what car you drive. The house, nobody sees that, but but the people who are your neighbors and where you live. And and let me tell you, psychologically, we've talked about this. The happiness factor happens right around 75,000 because that means you cover the basics. Mm -hmm. But if you are the poorest person on the street, and this is counterintuitive because you always hear if you buy the cheapest houses on your street, you're probably going to have the most appreciation yeah, you're opportunity. Yeah, make money on so the investment. Economically, it is the best opportunity. Psychologically, it is the worst decision. If you are the poorest person on your street, it will have negative consequences on you. So do not stretch yourself so that you're house rich, life poor. Because there's a lot of people that do that, and a so, lot of people give that advice to their young, to the kids, and real estate agents, mortgage brokers say, "Yeah, just stretch, stretch." And, and that's what we've actually we've actually seen that 38 million Americans spend more than 30 percent of their income on housing, up from 16 million in 2001. What that tells me immediately is that there are 30 million Americans that don't listen to the Money Guy Show, because if you listen to the Money Guy Show, you would know that spending 30 percent of your income on housing is not how to make f- sound financial decisions. That's not where you want to be when it comes to how much to spend on housing. No. So let's give some money guy. Let's give some give them some love on some money guy tips, and then also be confessional on how that down payment sure. works too. So Bo, walk them through. What is buying a house? What are the rules that the money guy puts out? So the very first thing, whenever you go to buy a house, you should think about your goal should be to put twenty percent down. And the reason you want to put twenty percent down is sort of twofold. You'd like to immediately have equity inside the house that you're buying, but also you don't want to be throwing money away on PMI, primary mm-hmm. mortgage insurance. If you can get to twenty percent, you don't have to worry about that. 
The other thing you should do is you should have a goal to have your house paid off by retirement. I can't tell you how many times someone calls us and says, hey, I'm thinking about retiring next year. And we'll say, awesome, tell me a little bit about your portfolio. Tell me a little bit about what you have going on. Oh, okay, and am I assuming you're debt free? Oh, no, 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 I still owe $700,000 on my house. And yeah. we're like, oh my, God. no, you, you can't be financially independent and have a mortgage. Those are two different things, or at least have the ability to pay off the mortgage. And then here's, here's the biggie, here's the really biggie. When it comes to how much of your income should go toward ho towards housing, your mortgage payment should be less than 25% of your gross income. So these 38 million Americans that are spending over 30% of their income on housing are already out of the gate doing it wrong. Yeah, I, I definitely think this is something that a lot of people get themselves in trouble is if, you, if you're looking at your car, you look at your housing, those are the biggest bites of the apple that are probably hurting your lifestyle. Now, I do want to give a little bit of love out there because I've all we've all been broke before. We've been in our 20s. We've been in our 30s where you're trying to get that first house. And you see this number of 20% down, and you're like, no way, no how. I mean, my just the, the market, if you're especially like we're in Nashville. Sure. But if you live on one of the coasts or in a hot city like Nashville, the appreciation on a house just alone will probably be more than what you could come up with in savings on yep. a down payment. So this, it almost feels like the housing market is running, running from, away from you, you yeah. instead of you being able to get a, a handle on the 20% down payment. So we are once again, very transparent and honest. Cause I asked around the entire office, there is not a single person here. Wait, wait a minute. Let me put that down. There are two people here. Cause I, I realized Eric and Carter. Now we have oh, one more yeah. new exception with, with Eric too. Cause I asked him these questions. But most people here did not put down 20%. It's okay on that first house if you have to, because you're, you're trying to get in, is because you don't want to neglect your savings. You don't want to neglect, you know, all thinking long-term right. and vision planning. But I will tell you, the 25%, there is no ifs, ands, or buts, because I do want to keep you away from getting in a situation where you do have this big honking house that's empty, carpeted, and you're sitting in the corner crying every night because you have no life that you're living outside of that. But I do want to give you enough grace to where you can at least hopefully get your first foot into a house at some point in your life. Now, second house, third house, I want you to be a little more deliberate with coming closer to that down payment goal. So we've talked about some consumption behavior, right? So credit cards and then buying cars and then buying houses. But then there is another kind of debt. Now this yeah. debt though is an investment. This is good debt because this is debt that you accumulate to better yourself, to improve your lot, to build on what you can work towards in the future. You're investing in yourself. Though. That's right. That's what that's what we're told. We're investing yourself. And look, I am big on always being a lifetime learner, investing yourself. But this thing with student loans, I'm disgusted with yep. what has happened because I looked at what it cost for me to go to the University of Georgia, and it was a heck of a lot more expensive for you to go to UGA. And then we hire full-time equivalent Daniel. I was shocked. If you remember, the inflation rate, and it was consistent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even a rounding error. It was a straight 7% 7%. per year, every year since I graduated in the mid-90s, all the way to Daniel graduating mm -hmm. just recently. I couldn't believe that. That blew my mind that education has such a big growth factor, so it has really run up a lot of debt on our young people. So let's give them the tools so they don't let this thing hang out too long, but also have a very healthy understanding of how to pay it down. Exactly. So as you're listening to the show, you're probably someone who's already got the student loan debt. So the question you have is, guys, I hear you talk about this 88 times over and how powerful my army of dollar bills can be. How should I approach building my army, but also satisfying my student loan debt and being nerdy math guys that we are, we came up with some simple mathematics to help you figure it out. And this information is based on the equity risk premium, which is yep. essentially the rate of return you get for taking on risk. Yep. You can kind of think about it in that. And here's what we kind of distilled it down to. If you're in your 20s and your student loans are more than 6%, you should probably prioritize paying them off over building your army of dollar bills. And a lot of people do have student loans over 6%. When I was recently, especially talking to like this group of engineers last week, a lot of them had interest rates six and three quarters, mm -hmm. six and seven eighths. So pay attention to what your interest rate is. You probably want to get aggressive if it's that high. That's right. If you're in your 30s and it's above 5%, you want to start prioritizing it off. And then once you get to your 40s, if your student loans are over 4%, you got to get them knocked out because by the time you get to 50s plus, you should not have any more student loan debt. Uh, you know, one of the things, because Daniel did the research, I'd feel horrible if we left this stat out. The average debt on student loans is 29800 You know, and that one doesn't, I'm actually kind of encouraged by that because what do we always say is the appropriate amount of student loan debt to rack up 
you really don't ever want to accumulate more student loan debt than what you will earn in your first year working. Well, if you look at the average income in this country and you see that $30,000 to, okay, that kind of, it's nice to see it's not some crazy egregious number like eighty, ninety, dollars a hundred thousand $100,000 on average. We'll save that for the doctors. That's right. That's like, that's right. <laughs> They're the ones they that will get the, the six up. figure. They'll bring it way up. But, but still, it's one of those things. So, Bo, let's kind of talk about, because we've talked about the big debts. Sure. But there are things that you can do also that are decisions that you can die from a death from 10,000 paper cuts too. Yeah, we, we think that there are some small decisions that can cost you a fortune over the long term. And so one of the things we wanted to investigate was how much do people spend on different areas of their life? And so uh, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics from Market Watch and from the Consumer Electronics Association. And this is what we found. On average, Americans spend a little, almost $300 a month eating out. So 300 bucks a month going out and eating out at restaurants. And, and by the way, nothing wrong with going out to eat sure. as long as you can afford it. That's right. What I'm worried about is people who are eating out and ke- creating this lifestyle who aren't checking the other boxes first. That's so exactly don't misread right. us. I'm not against the 288 eating out. I'm more about you doing this when you don't have your financial order of operations in a good place. If you tell us, oh man, I just can't save, things are so tight, and then we see you out on the weekends, you know, going to pick up burgers instead of eating at home, you, maybe you're not doing it right. Uh, $100 per month on electronics. Yeah, I'm so, a gadget guy, so that doesn't shock me at all. Uh, how about this one? Apparel, on average, the average American spends $156 a month on clothes. I'm skewing that number way down. Way down. Uh, Am- my wife, Amazon my wife is helping on the other side, so we are kind of got a push-pull system working right now. And this next one I thought was really interesting, because we've done shows on this before in the past. The average American spends 200 and almost $40 a month on subscriptions. Now, I did, because I, I asked Daniel, I was like, Daniel, you got to give me some stats. on well, How is that number so big? And I do know it includes... You know, like your internet bill. That that is oh, built well, that's into that. Different. But that's... but but this is the newest ground battleground for your dollars. And and look, I'll be self confessional. I switch. I cut the cord so proud. We even did. You can go find our show where we did cutting the cord because I moved to YouTube TV. Sure. And it was a huge savings because I went from like hundred and ten dollars a month all the way down to thirty five. That looks great. But here's the problem. I have backfilled all was, those savings. What's 35? I, I have backfilled. First of all, YouTube TV has gone up. I think we're over 50 bucks now. Oh, wow. We, we did add HGTV. So there's, oh, there's, some, okay. there's some wins okay. there. We also had TNT for NBA basketball. So they, they, they've had, had channels. So I'm not even going to pick on them too much for okay. raising the prices. But the problem, here's where I do have a problem, is how we keep backfilling. I mean, you've got Hulu. You've got Netflix. You've got Prime. And then Disney Plus Disney comes Plus, on the scene. Yep. And then even before Disney Plus comes on the scene, Apple has their own streaming channel. I know NBC has their own thing. CBS All Access because they have Star Trek and some other custom stuff. And before you know it, guys, there is no doubt you'd be spending more money on all these subscriptions than you would be if you just were back on your old school cable This is, you guys, you have to be very deliberate on what you're going to subscribe to. Now, I love what you said there, Brian, because you said two things I thought that just hit me so well. And this is just right in line with our our money guy tips, is you said, hey, I'm a gadget guy, Mm -hmm. so I don't mind spending money on gadgets. You said, hey, I like Disney Plus. I like this. It's okay to spend money on the things that you like and the things that you care about. The main, main thing is... Making sure, and we put this umbrella over a lot of our advice and content, you got to be saving 20 to 25% of your income. If you can make sure you're covering the basics, if you want to have every streaming subscription, I'm okay with that. Matter of fact, I love my Disney Plus yep. and I bundle it with Hulu. And by the way, if y'all have not checked out the Imagineering series that is on, the Disney Plus, it's you're good. missing it. Oh my! I, 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 Reby and I have already nerded out on this thing. Oh, did I you mean, have this conversation without me? I yeah. wasn't a part. No, of it. it is. It is so good. I will tell you one one mistake. You know, my youngest, she's very, she loves the Disney magic, yeah. but you know, and she's autistic. She's ten years old, but she's more like the, a six year old sure. on, on kind of the way she processes the world. We had it on while she was in there. Didn't think anything of because she's a huge Disney fan sure. too. And they were doing the um, the new James Cameron world. What is it? Um, you know, over in Animal Kingdom, um, Pan- Pandora, Pandora, Pandora with the floating rocks. She saw where they were showing how they did the floating rocks. She practically started crying. She goes, "So it's fake." 
She had no, my daughter had no idea. So we ruined it by watching this Imagineering oh, no. show. So I do want to tell you, there are some risks to watching some of these behind the scenes shows, but it is fulfilling to watch the vision that Walt Disney had. And each series kind of walks through Imagineers and how they kind of fulfilled Walt's visions and then how that went to all the different CEOs as well as, it's just incredible, incredible stuff. I know a lot, I'll be going to Shanghai at some point, you know, just because I, I know so much about it from watching this. Okay, that is so not on topic. That, that part was get for free. so many that. troll comments from that, but I couldn't help myself. So, so when it comes to this consumption behavior, and when it comes to watching Imagineering, focus on spending on the things that make you happy, but don't do it out of whack with the order of operations. So if you can follow the money out order of operations, it will give you the freedom and the flexibility to spend. And then the second thing is, if you are someone who's like using something like credit cards, if you are doing that sort of thing, make sure that you pay them off in full every month. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, if you're not paying them off monthly, you are digging yourself deeper. And Bo, I know you had asked Daniel, he said, hey, I heard that the average debt is around 8,400. Run us some stats on what that looks like if you just paid the minimum. Yeah, so what we said is, okay, if we, if we have the average uh, annual percentage rate of 17.3%, of most credit card companies will let you pay a minimum of either $25 or 3% of your outstanding balance. So let's just say that you wanted to go buy something for the average price on a credit card, $8,400. Well, it's going to take you 189 months to pay that thing off. So your initial purchase of $8,398 is going to cost you $7,120 in interest over that almost 16 years. That thing that you bought will have cost you $15,518. It's Was kind of it disgusting? Worth it? Uh, that really breaks your heart. First of all, to see something that almost has like a mortgage type amortization mm -hmm. schedule that very likely you have given to the thrift store years ago yep. and you're still paying for it, that is not a good step towards financial independence. That's right. So pay attention. Don't fake it until you make it, guys. Don't let the consumerism take over. We're trying to get you addicted to a healthy lifestyle of paying yourself first, being a good field journal for your army of dollar bills so you don't have to work. There will come a point you don't have to work so hard with your back, brains, and your hands. You'll let your money do the work for you. So don't get ahead of yourself. Reward yourself. Celebrate by dumping the Gatorade when you have just graduated and you've just made it to the starting line. You have won absolutely nothing, so don't fake it until you've actually started having some accomplishments. So remember, we said there, we think there are three reasons why Americans are broke. You know, number one was no budget or plan. Number two was this unhealthy relationship with debt. But we think that there is one decision, and this one decision, grasping this one concept, will have the biggest impact on your financial future and how successful ultimately you'll be from a financial perspective. So when I first got, I mean, I was already working in the field. I'd already left on my first, started my first company in 2002. But I looked around and I was like, you know what is really screwed up in the world is how young people have no idea how money works. Mm -hmm. So I went to the local school system. This is back in Georgia and approached the superintendent and said, I want to teach these kids the power of personal finance. Sure. This is before the Money Guy Show because they realize this is 2003 that I'm doing all this stuff. Started the Money Guy Show in 2006. The superintendent, Dr. Jack Parrish, loved the concept. So he immediately hooked me up with a high school I remember doing the first one in a trailer because the school was so overcapacitated, over, so overcapacity. <laughs> yeah, I said that wrong. Overcapacity. That's why maybe that's why he put me in the trailer. But anyway, these kids and the first concept I told them this long story. The big thing I told them, guys, there is one thing I want you to take from today's presentation. If you can understand this one concept, it will absolutely change your life. It's that deferred gratification is the foundation for all financial empires right. that are built out there. If you can take just a teeny tiny bit of today for an awesome tomorrow, this thing will multiply. I mean, it really is Jack's magic beans is deferred gratification. The earlier you realize the concept, the bigger your vision of success can actually be. Yeah, you said something so, so poignant right there, Brian. The earlier that you can grasp this, the sooner that you can grasp this, the bigger and more impactful and more powerful it'll be for your long-term success. So it's only so fair 
that I still remember there was an illustration I pulled from that curriculum because I'd gone to a local credit union organization to give me curriculum. And, and they even, I knew it was meant to be when the first chapter covered deferred gratification. I was like, we are cooking with some bacon grease. I mean, this is good stuff here. But they, there was an illustration I have used for years. I've used it in 401k presentations. Mm-hmm. I've used it in a lot of other stuff. And Bo, when we did this show meeting, we were like, we got to pull it out. Now, producer Reby, just so y'all know, she didn't love this idea. So if you don't like it, then Reby's right. If you love this, if you believe, if you're one of these people that's given hallelujahs to deferred gratification, this concept will hit you right between the eyes. So uh, go ahead and load them up, Bo. So let's talk about the advantage of starting early. So let's take three savers, and all we're going to do is say these savers are going to max out their Roth IRAs every year. They're going to do $6,000. we are not going to assume indexing or any of that kind of stuff, and let's just assume that they can all earn the same rate of return. They're all going to earn 8% over the long term while they're investing. Man, you really, you're not giving the trolls any ammunition no, here, because normally we go aggressive while you're younger and bring it down slower. Nope. So you just said, you know what, we're going to choose a moderate 8%. That's trolls, exactly you right. just go on back. There's nothing to see here. Get under your bridge. So here's the answer. $500 per month, or six $6,000 a year earning 8%. So let's look at three different savers. Saver number one is Adam. Adam is, he's, you know, he just graduated. He's like me. He graduated college early and he said, you know what? I'm going to come out of the gates running. I'm going to start saving from the time I'm 20 and I'm going to save for my entire 20s. But when I get to 30, I'm going to start living life. I'm going to start enjoying. So, you know, I, I, I'll do this deferred thing. I'll do it for a while. But when I get to 30, then, you know, I'm going to get married and have kids and do all the things. Well, then there was Bill. Bill said, you know what? I just got through school. I'm, I don't want to start saving yet. I have earned my right to go spend and go do the things. So in my 20s, I'm just going to go all out and I'm going to enjoy it. But, but I recognize I'm losing some time. So I'm going to start saving $6,000 a year every year from the time that I turn 30 all the way until I retire, until I'm 65, all the way through my 64th year. And then there's Cleo. And Cleo, she just says, you know what? I'm going to do it for the whole time. I'm not going to do this early thing in party. I'm just going to save 6000 from the time I'm 20 all the way to the end of my career. Well, so this is what we thought was interesting. When you add up all the numbers, Adam, who saved only in his 20s, saved $60,000. $6,000 a year for 10 years. Bill, who saved for 35 years from age 30 to 64, he saved $210,000. Yeah. So naturally... Who has more money? That's three and a half times the amount of money that's right. invested. That's that's pretty incredible. This is one of those things. This is this is a wake up call to those who don't understand compounding interest. The sooner you start, the sooner you let your money work. Holy cow! Get out of its way because Bo, give them the big reveal. Because sixty thousand from Adam, two hundred ten thousand from Bill. For sure, you're thinking common sense wise. There's no way sixty overcomes two ten. So Adam became a millionaire. He turned his $6,000 every year just for 10 years into almost $1.3 million, more than a millionaire. Bill, who saved $210,000, he also became a millionaire. But look at this. He only ended up with a terminal value of just over $1,030,000. Even though he saved three and a half times as much, he had about $250,000 less. Before you show them how smart Cleo is, here's something I think is interesting. Adam, who only invested his first 10 years out, if you do the math on that, that's about 5%. So it's 5% is his contribution. Mm-hmm. The 95% is from appreciation, sure. meaning the army of dollar bills worked for him. Bill still did a good job. Started at 30, stayed for 35 years. But if you notice, he's about 20% of is his initial contribution. The other 80% is mm-hmm. growth. Still healthy, but man, Adam has it so much easier with only a 5% right. contribution. That's that's incredible. But then there's Cleo. And Cleo said, you know what? I'm not going to do this either or. I'm just going to save the whole time. I'm just going to be consistent. And what she said is, I'm going to save 6000 every year. And so she actually saves $270,000. So it's only... $60,000 more than Bill or 210000 more than Adam. What did she end up with at retirement? Over $2.3 million. She's a multimillionaire, not because she really behaved any differently than the two of the other guys. She just stayed consistent starting as early as she could. So th- there's multiple components here. Start early. Mm-hmm. Be consistent. Yep. And the other thing is, is that if you think about this in terms of you're looking for freedom, if you can pay yourself first, 
it's okay once you get to that 20, 25% to start thinking about other things. That's where you can start rewarding yourself, start living a little bit extra, but make sure you're covering the basics Absolutely. first. It's just that's such a powerful thing. And that's what, you know, we wanted to give you guys kind of some motivation, but also give you some data so that you can wake up that invisible hand to realize how powerful all the elements are working for you to be financially successful. You just have to start actually participating in the process. Actually get up, be a part of the success that's going on economically, and you can wake up one day and realize this has happened for you too. So a lot of you probably realize, Hey, we're loading you up. We're giving you tons of free advice. What is the catch? What are these guys asking for? It's all built upon the principle of the abundance cycle. Right. We're going to come. You come here. We're going to let you learn, apply, grow. I don't know if it's going to be five years in the future. I don't know if it's 10 years in the future. I don't know if it's 15 years in the future. There's going to come a point that you're going to be so successful. You're going to go, I need a co-pilot. I need somebody to look over my shoulder, tell me where things are, or maybe I'm worried, will my spouse, they don't think about money the way I do. I need somebody who thinks like these guys do. So to make sure this thing doesn't go in the ditch just after I leave, we see people all the time. That will be the abundance cycle that will start nudging you and telling you, hey, you remember those guys who kind of loaded you up a lot of advice? That's when you'll reach back out to a bound wealth or the money guy. We have a contact us page. Yep. Go check that out. But also, I want to tell you a, a little a little humble brag. We just crossed 50,000. We I mean it was what? Just a few days a few ago. Days ago yep. So this thing is picking up speed. I have a goal. And now that I've spoken it out loud, it kind of has to happen and I need your help. You guys, I don't take anything for granted. We say thank you all the time, but I do need your help. I need you to go tell at least 3 friends and family about the money guy show. Because I need that number to be 100,000 by 1231. So 100,000 YouTube subscribers. Go ahead and ring the bell so you get the notifications. We do a lot of live shows. Mm -hmm. We want you to jump in on those. I I feel like I can quit barking now at everybody, Bo. But but I am excited about it. I think there's a lot of great things going on in the year 2020. And it's one of those things I want to get the Money Guy family engaged in that process too. We're so excited. We're so committed to this abundance cycle. Obviously, you guys come here. You get to learn from the show. You get to learn from the stuff we put out there. If you haven't had a chance to go out to our website, go to our website. We have a blog there if you like consuming written content, we can go a little bit deeper. And we even have a resource page. If you've not gone out to the resource page, gone and taken advantage of the free resources, PDFs, spreadsheets, um, deliverables, things that you can actually take with you, share with your family, share with your friends, it is there for you. So make sure you go check it out so that we can continue this abundant cycle through through time. Thanks, guys. Money Guy team, out.